morning. Good to see everyone. So I thought I'd talk about change today, partly because I feel as if I've been doing a battle with the pace of change. And um, when I have to speak about something, it forces me to really think about it and work it through and you know, get some insights. And I think it would be relevant to you people at Unity, both collectively dealing with change and individually, because I'm sure you've all got your own change challenges going on. So here's an example of one of mine. A couple of months ago, I confronted my husband, Derek, about how our relationship was going, because you know, we were kind of coexisting at the time, but uh, not particularly close. Well, when you ask a question like that, you have to be prepared for the answer, right? <laughs> so I discovered he was feeling turned off me by my irritation with technology. So we share an office, and for the most part, you know, that works really well. It certainly works well for me, having tech support just there, you know, within touching and hearing distance. Some people will remember Derek used to do Bob's job with the, the AV over here. So for me, technology is often tedious and frustrating and mysterious and irritating. So like you, I've learned how to use a computer and send emails and I've, you know, and search things on the web and I've made a Facebook page and I've done some social media and I've learned how to make e-newsletters and I can use the content management system of the website, you know, and I'm developing webinars and online training. So I'm having a go, right? But I often get frustrated by how much there is to learn and how long it takes to master it, you know, and all the problems. And I get frustrated because I can't get on with my creative work because I'm busy tied up learning all this technical stuff. Can you relate? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Well, it turns out Derek was feeling annoyed witnessing my struggle with it, right? Because, you know, he'd hear me sigh and exclaim and curse because remember, he's just over there. And I'm very loud and expressive, right? And he's well, what you resist persists, right? So while they were resisting and fighting all this new technology and getting more and more hit up in fruitless frustration because technology is here to stay, isn't it? Right? We're not getting rid of it anytime soon. And thinking about that, I had this light bulb moment how to you know, explain how I was feeling to him. And I said, right now we are living in the era of revenge of the nerds, <laughs> you know? And so it's like, you know, this is a time where in order to succeed, you have to be able to do well with technology. And I, I flipped it on him and I said, what if in order to succeed in life, you had to be able to write a novel? Well, I think he sort of understood that. He became a bit less critical of me after that. And, and I felt less resistant to technology because I felt hurt, you know. So I came out of that conversation feeling more willing to suck it up, you know, to deal with the, the technology thing. And while I still do sign exclaim at times, I think it's a little bit less. So, as you know, a first principle of life is that if we want to change out there, we have to make the first change in here, as you were just talking, you know, saying Bill. And that principle has a, a spiritual or mystical root, you know, in the teaching, I am that, and we are one, and everything is interconnected, right? The world is our mirror, everything out there is a reflection of what's in here, and there's physical <coughs> evidence, you know, to back that up as well. And we create our reality. We can't point the finger, you know, and, and blame others, right? We can't just wait for things to change, right? As the old saying goes, for things to change, first time must change. And even if it were not true that we create our reality, then that attitude of empowerment, that of responsibility is the most empowering attitude we can take. So here at Unity, we want change, right? We want more people to discover the riches that we have to offer, right? And to join in. And I know that you are a very devoted crew of regulars here. You have a very dedicated board. You have a very generous minister in Bill who's been supported by Sylvia. So really, Bill's just come back energised from the States. I know that you are taking on the nerdy tech challenge with your online courses and books and recording of the, the present, the talks and all that sort of stuff. And I understand it's beginning to generate some results, which is great. But let me play a confronting role for a while, all right? And share why I think we get stuck. And if I offend you, you can help me with sandwiches from the morning tea table, all right? So, you see, thinking about, about Unity, it struck me that Unity used to be a pioneer, all right? It had the edge. Compared to other, um, you know, religions, Unity had the most leading edge ideas about life, spirituality, the Bible, you know, we have the most beautiful balance of the sacred and the practical. 
simple empowering principles and very durable strategies. We weren't drowning in rituals and dogma and rules, and we weren't dependent on a priest's blessings and forgiveness, right? But we've lost that edge because the world has caught up and is passing and leaving us behind. Knowledge about consciousness and universal laws is now the most mainstream. When the film wars began unity, New Thought was a pioneer movement, but today this stuff is virtually common knowledge. Many do yoga and learn about the power of the mind. Many watch movies like The Secret and The Opus and Emotion and Conversations with God. If you're on Facebook, you can see from the things that people are posting that a lot of people share these values and these ideas, right? There are more and more teachers and principles devoted to these principles, and the competition is huge. And unity's been falling behind. We've been looking more and more like a dinosaur. You know, we've been especially losing relevance for a young audience, and if you lose relevance, you die. So this pressure to grow is true for each of us personally as well. We each want something, we've got a dream of some kind, whether it's business success or artistic success or social impact or family harmony or, you know, whatever, financial, whatever it is. I want to write the books in my heart and have them find a worldwide readership, right? And those of, us who have, those of you who've read my books know I've had some degree of impact there. But I've lost a lot of momentum, you know. My book sales and my other business careers have dwindled. They've really died down a lot. So why is that? Now, Dr. Martini talks about the laws of entropy and centropy. Entropy is the natural principle of breakdown and decay in the universe. And centropy is its opposite. Right? It's when things evolve to higher levels of order. He says that if we're not living at our highest and fullest potential, resources are taken away from us and directed to the people who are living at their highest and fullest. This is confronting stuff. And the empty seats here and my dwindling book sales, right, are not an unhappy coincidence, right? The reflection of who we are being. The law of consciousness states that we don't get what we want, we get what we are, right? We are putting out a vibration and that vibration draws to it similar resonances. And this is, as far as community is concerned, that's not any one person's fault, is it? Because this is a co-creation, it's a shared creation. This is not about any one person's intention. It's about a whole community. So where is this community vibrating? The library at the back there, and the daily word, and the messages, and, the, and the, even our beautiful pink walls and all of that, that indicate an intention, you know, love, and inspiration, and truth. But the behaviour and, and the energy of each individual person, right, is what co-creates the result. I understand, for instance, that only half a dozen people returned the questionnaire around the direction for unity to go. That's a little sobering. So why do we experience no or slow change even when we know all the beautiful and empowering truths that unity teaches? So here's something I learned. When we don't achieve our intentions, we often think we're failing, we're sabotaging ourselves, you know, but actually we are fulfilling other goals that are more important to us. For example, you set a goal to become fitter, you decide to go for a run every morning. So you're good for a few days or weeks, you know, and then it gets colder, darker, and wetter. And suddenly it's a lot harder to get out of bed in the morning. Yeah. And the goal to sleep more become, it takes precedence over the goal for great fitness. We are always successful at achieving our most important goals. So here's a personal example. I know that I built my business with my foot on the brake, right? Because much as I wanted to be a famous author and an in-demand speaker and so forth, being available to my family was a high priority. So I'm sure I sabotaged lots of opportunities in the, in the vocational arena in order to be around for my kids. So our goals and dreams aren't realised because at some level, even if it's unconscious, we are happier or safer where we are right now. This is only the shadow kind of work. Dr. De Martini asks clients who want to rid themselves of addiction. He says, why do you want to smoke or eat or drink, or whatever it is? And they object, I say, I don't, that's why I'm here. Huh? And he says, if you didn't want it, you wouldn't be doing it. Some part of you wants it because it's serving you in some way. And until you can own the part that wants the addiction, you'll never transform it. Any time we're not getting what we think we want, we need to ask ourselves how this current form is serving us. 
So how does it serve unity that we have a small attendance? How does it serve unity that we're not standing out, not leading the way, not ribbing with people and activities? What's the pace? At what level do we want this smallness? Until we can own the benefits in, to the current form, we won't be able to transform it. And there's no point judging ourselves for our values, right? They are what they are. But we can change them if we consciously decide to. Have you seen, has anyone seen the Anthony Robbins documentary, You Are I Am Not Your Guru? It's fantastic. I think you can access it and watch it. It's very moving. This is about this how this quite extraordinary personal growth leader. He talks at the beginning of the film about the huge character changes that he made. He deliberately created the Anthony Robbins that who leads and serves millions of people around the world, who consults with world leaders, who has transformed his own life. He experienced such poverty as a child that he developed a burning desire to break free of that kind of struggle and to be able to look after his family better. He consciously decided who he wanted to be and he deliberately worked at becoming that person. He learned how to deliberately change his mental and emotional state. He learned how to associate pain with remaining small and pleasure with growing into the person he wanted to be. He affirmed that he was unstoppable. How many of us have that kind of burning desire to create a different life? How many of us spend a devoted period of time every day declaring empowering statements? allowed and consciously transforming each limiting thought and emotion as it arises. I believe that unity is playing small because we are playing small individually. If we as individual members of unity were truly shining and transforming our lives, people would be asking, how are you doing this? And then we could say, well, I applied this law or principle and, and you can too, come along to unity be, to be inspired and learn how. So we're struggling to change is it because we're not prioritising that intention not making it sufficiently important. Are we waiting for others to change things for us? There's another reason for our inability to change beside the lack of burning desire, and that reason lies curled up inside us like a worm. And it's our belief system. It's our beliefs, our self-image, our identity, our personal story. Books like Psycho-Cybernetics teach us that our self-image is the key to our life experiences. If we hold beliefs about ourselves being worthy and deserving, then we'll experience that reality. If we hold beliefs that we're not worthy and deserving, we'll experience that reality. As Bob Proctor says, we don't can't plant carrots and get pineapples. Like a worm, these limiting childhood beliefs eat away at our confidence and keep us small. It's often easier to find evidence that we aren't good enough and don't, des and don't deserve than it is to find evidence for our greatness. Because we were wounded as children, we haven't yet healed the wound. We have a whole life story of concrete examples and evidence of our incapacity. And appearances can be very convincing to everyone. So we prove our incapacity to ourselves over and over again. I know that I have been held back by my limiting beliefs. And it takes persistence to recognise what the worm is whispering and to throw off the old shackles. We do it layer by layer, never all at once. If anyone tells you they can help you transform, be wary of having unrealistic expectations or putting them on a pedestal. Everyone incarnate is still working with these principles and it's a layer by layer game. I had a great conversation with Tanya uh, last Thursday about how frustrating it is to know about universal laws and the power of the mind and yet experience no significant breakthrough while others with no knowledge of these laws have lives that flow. You know, they land the perfect job, the perfect partner turns up as easy as possible. They lose weight easily when we've struggled, you know. They win things, not fair, you know. We know that those friends who appear to have perfect lives also have issues and challenges, but often we can't see their challenges. So it's easy to beat ourselves up with comparisons. I know I've played that game myself. You know, people have put me up on a pedestal, not knowing what I'm struggling with, and I've put lots of people up there too. And when we grumble about things like this, we also know that we're acting like victims and being negative. And since we understand about the power of the mind, we want to be positive. But sometimes we can get so lost and confused and listening to the word, you know, that we just don't know what to do to lift ourselves out of the rut we're in. 
Nobody walks their talk all the time. But we wouldn't go to an overweight, smoking, wheezing, pimply health and fitness practitioner, right? There needs to be some congruence. And likewise, if we want to transform life, it begins with a transformed us. We must persist. Like a baby that learns to walk by picking itself up 6,000 times, approximately, you know, in the process of learning, we must keep picking ourselves up and choosing more useful thoughts. We apply the same law to manifest lack as to manifest abundance. The subconscious mind is a computer. It impersonally builds on whatever seed we sow. So if we're not realising our dreams, it's not a case of bad luck. It's not that people out there are too dumb to realise what we have to offer. It's the outplay of law, of energetic principles. We have to face this and own it as individuals and as an organisation, right, to take responsibility. Derek and I recently discovered that we have participated in a um, property investment scam. So I can't say that we were victims of the scam because that's not true. We attracted the experience because this is a lawful universe. Right? We can't blame or play the victim. Our sales rep left the company as soon as he found out what was going on and he shared the information with us. He was so outraged by the leaders of the scam that he caused himself serious heart disease and ended up having quadruple bypass surgery. <coughs> he was shocked that I wasn't upset. And much as I'm not happy about losing the money, right, I get that we created the experience. A fool and his money are soon parted. Right? It doesn't matter how true it is that the property company behaved unethically. The other side of the equation is that we behaved irresponsibly. We didn't do our due diligence, right? The fool and the con man are attracted together. And cause and effect must be united for healing to occur. If we insist that it happened to us, it happened to us, we don't grow. Right? Once we own our part in it, we begin to heal and we activate the possibility of transforming the situation, whatever it is. So I'm writing that book, Business Lessons from the Dark Side for Light Workers, because we light workers tend to be naive and gullible and overly trusting and too generous and not sufficiently street smart. And part of our growth process is to take responsibility and to understand the deal and to set appropriate boundaries. So negative thinking is kind of demonised in the personal development world. Friends of mine once shared a story about an event they attended where one of the guest speakers was a wealth coach. My friends felt a bit wary of his spiel and the investment opportunity he was promoted, you know, he was offering group. And they raised concerns with the other people in the group. And they were criticised by the others for being negative. Some months later, this fellow disappeared with a whole lot of money of the other people's, you know. So our negative thoughts could be giving us important information, right? Often they're inviting us to look more deeply into the issue and be less naive and gullible. So looking at the bright side is not always the wisest thing to do. Those negative thoughts do serve a valuable purpose, you know, like the um, vehicle's fuel light, it's feedback to us, you know, that the tank is empty in the, in the car, and our negative thoughts provide feedback to us about how we're thinking and feeling and believing, right? So negative thoughts like, I can't do it all, I'm not coping, provide important feedback that it's time to get help, to delegate, to reapproach, to restructure. The problem with negative thoughts is just when we allow them to disempower us. As a feedback system, they're very useful, right? So long as we're conscious of them. So have you identified your negative thoughts about your goals, paid attention, paid attention to those issues, rather than just brushing them aside? You know, have we at Unity looked honestly at our negative thoughts about growing and expanding this organisation? Have we owned how small this serves us? Just as society favours positivity over negativity, we tend to reject competition in favour of cooperation. But this is equally unrealistic. We need both competition and cooperation in the evolutionary journey. The organisations that are currently leading the way in New Thought at the moment, they're our competition. And they serve us by making us get clear on our values and our unique contribution, build a compelling vision and a burning desire and get into action. Whatever you might think of Donald Trump as a potential president of the United States, we can learn from him in the business arena. I gather that he has 13 contingency plans for things potentially going wrong in his businesses. He has thought through all the potential obstacles, right? And he's ready to come when something goes wrong. This is clearly not being negative. This is being prepared. They say that luck is preparation meeting opportunity. So why is change the difficult one? Dishonesty about what we really want. Two, the lack of burning desire. 
three, a limited something which keeps us small. Four, wanting the outcome, but not the journey. I really want to be a best-selling empowerment author, right? But do I really want to do all the marketing and internet marketing and you know, all that? Not so much. But if we want the outcome, we have to embrace the journey as well. If we want to be fit, we have to get out of bed when it's dark and cold and wet. If we want bums on seats in here, we have to do the self-examination and brainstorm wildly and act on our ideas. It seems as if doing positive things is more difficult than doing negative things, and that's because it is. It's much easier to slide down a hill than to walk up one. Right? It's easier to say, I can't, when we're feeling down and there's no evidence that you can, than it is to say, I can. But if we want, if we want to change in our world out there, then we have to make that change in here. First gear takes more energy and fuel than any of the others because we go from stationary to being in motion. For a rocket ship, it's called escape velocity, to escape gravity, right? It's the energy needed to get out of inertia for us, right? Sometimes we stay stuck because we aren't sure what to do. But as they say, it's better to try something and correct than to keep waiting because we're waiting for the you know, perfect moment or perfect circumstances or whatever. Some years ago, I had a blinding flash of the obvious regarding affirmations when I realised I had to stick with them until I got the result, rather than just sprinkling a few here and there and, you know, expecting a change to occur. I realised I had to declare grounded affirmations for good and to declare them often enough to make a dent in my existing self-image, to unfreeze it and begin to form a new identity. It's as a lifestyle practice, like eating three times a day, right? until the new thoughts became my actual natural beliefs about myself, like Anthony Robbins has done. This sort of change doesn't happen overnight. I've had some success with consciously changing my beliefs and some spectacular failures, you know, where I've spent long periods of time in a dark and self-pitying place indulging in envy. Last week, I had a significant realisation about what I could do differently to claw my way out of some limited thinking yet again, right? So the problem with living consciously is that we're too busy and distracted to stay conscious of our thoughts all day. Do you, do you agree? You know? It's like, we are mystics without monasteries, as Caroline Mace says. We are attempting to evolve spiritually while we hold down a job and run a business and study and raise a family, manage a household and have a few hobbies and eat well and exercise and be there for family and friends and deal with the traffic, right? We are run off our feet. We don't have the luxury of living in a monastery just where we only have to meditate and um, you know plant the uh, weed the garden. That's ignorant speaking, but I'm sure you get my point, right? In the Mastery Club, my book, I give the example of using old-fashioned kitchen scales to demonstrate how many empowering thoughts it takes to create a change in our results. So the characters in my book use coffee beans, you know, one bean per affirmation to make it concrete. Because I realised I needed a visual reminder and a concrete anchor for thinking consciously and creatively. So I decided I'd get myself some scales, right? And I'd do this. And then I had an even better idea. I don't like the idea of flicking, you know, the elastic band every time you have a negative thought. So I decided I would reward positive thoughts instead. So, oops. I put this bowl, you see these? of uh, these pretty coloured wish stones on my desk, right? And um, I decided I've got these two oops, empty bowls next to it. I'm not all making too much noise now, I'm off the recording. And what happens is every time I have a positive empowering thought through the day, I drop a wish stone in a bowl. And every time I catch myself, in a negative thought, in a limiting belief, and change it, I drop a thought in the bowl. I drop a stone in the bowl. Oh, it's a thought. So each time the wishing stone drops in, I hear this lovely chime against the glass, and I feel encouraged. I did something concrete. I have to confess that when I started doing this, I was utterly shocked by how few consciously creative thoughts I was having. If you get to the end of the day and there are three coloured stones in the positive thinking bowl and you and none in the change your thoughts bowl and you call yourself a conscious life creator, well that's very sobering. 
So my stones and my bowls are a brilliant way, practical way, for me to train myself to become more conscious and think more deliberately, rather than just trusting myself to manage. I have proof of 52 years I have been doing it. Okay. So, let's all declare a few positive empowering thoughts together right now, okay? We'll so the first one, I, I'm, we're starting with my, my, you know, my famous three, right? So my words and thoughts determine my destiny. Are you ready? My, my words, words and thoughts determine my destiny. destiny. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the next one is, I am in charge of my words and thoughts. I am in charge of my words and thoughts. That's what we're doing for you. Next one is, the faster I change my language to empowering phrases, faster I transform my life. Okay. So the faster oh, I change my language to empowering phrases, the faster I transform my life. And you know. Right. Next one is I am deserving. I am deserving. And the last one is quite a long one, so I'm going to give it to you. It's right. So this is after my contribution. My, my contribution, my loving service, my loving service, my creative gifts, my creative gifts are valued and wanted. Are valued and wanted, and people delight in paying me richly for them. <laughs> and people delight in paying me richly for them. Great, we go. So the desire to transform a whole organisation is quite a lot bigger. So it's going to take a lot more action and commitment, right? I remember Dr. Martini saying that if you want to make a difference in yourself, you have to have a vision at least as big as your family. If you want to make a difference in your family, you have to have a vision at least as big as your community. If you want to make a difference in your community, you have to have a vision at least as big as your city. If you want to make a difference in the city, your vision has to be as big as the state. If you want to make a difference in the level of the state, your vision has to be as big as the nation. If you want to make, have a national impact, you have to have a global vision. If you want to touch the world and leave an immortal legacy, you have to have an astronomical, soul-inspired vision. I was listening to an audio book about an ex-jockey who becomes a detective and is asked to look into a case regarding an old race course. The baddies are engaging in sabotage because they want to redevelop the land. But he wants it to survive. He's asked what he would do to rescue the place. And he replies, everything. I pinch every crap good crowd pulling idea that any other race course is thought of. And I put them all into operation on the same day. I take the whole of the reserve fund and offer it as a prize for a big race. I'd make sure the race was framed to attract the really top chasers. Then I'd go around to the trainers in person and explain the situation and beg for their support. I'd go to some of the people who sponsored Gold Cup races and cajole them into giving 500 pound prizes for all the other races on the day. I'd make the whole thing into a campaign. I'd get Save Seabury discussed on television and on the sports columns of newspapers. I'd get people interested and involved. I'd make helping the sorry, I'd make helping Seabury the smart thing to do. I'd get someone like the Beatles to come and present the trophies. I'd advertise free car parking and free race cars, and on the day I'd have the whole place bright with flags and bunting and tubs of flowers to hide the lack of paint. I'd make sure everyone on the staff understood that a friendly welcome must be given to the customers, and I'd insist that a cage for catering firm used its imagination. I'd fix the meeting at the beginning of April and pray for a sunny spring day. That would do for a start. And afterwards, the, uh, the, the boss sort of person asked, alone, I suppose, either from the back bank or from private individuals, but the executive would have to show first that Seabury could be a success again like it used to be. No one falls over himself to lend money to a dying business. The revival has to come before the money, if you see what I mean. The revival in here has to come before the revival out there, if you see what I mean. So let's sum up. One, change is inevitable. We can't fight it. And if we resist, we lose, we suffer. Very nice. If we want to transform our circumstances, we must first acknowledge how the current form is serving us. We must be honest about our actual values. Then we must have a burning desire for change. 
We need to keep alive our reason and our vision for the change, for why we want it and do whatever it takes. If we're having a go and nothing is changing, we need to do some deeper work to unravel the childhood wounds and limiting beliefs that might be tripping us up. We need to embrace the journey as much as the outcome. And of course we can pray and visualise and have faith and do energy clearings, but we also need to take action. We need to work here in matter as well as in spirit. We need to strike out into the uncomfortable zone by doing something even if it's the wrong thing initially. And to do all of this successfully, we need a community, just like this one, a mastery club, where we can give and receive support. Because when we are stumbling, it helps to be inspired and encouraged by others who are succeeding. That's it.